The learning objectives of this prostate cancer laboratory are twofold. First, by the end, you should be able to recognize the normal architecture of the prostate and distinguish it from invasive adenocarcinoma. And secondly, you should know how to grade prostate cancers according to the Gleason scale. Now, before I go through the slides, I would like to give you a brief overview of the significant features of prostate cancer. In many ways, prostate cancer in men is analogous to breast cancer in women. For one thing, it is the most common type of cancer in males. Also, while it is the most prevalent form of cancer, it comes in second with regard to mortality. And again, the reason is that lung cancer, while less common, is far more lethal. The risk factors include several of those for breast cancer, namely age, ethnicity, diet, and family history. And finally, the symptoms include difficulty urinating, lower back pain, loss of appetite, and weight. Again, early diagnosis and treatment has been critical in reducing the mortality rates of prostate cancer. Screening includes blood tests for the level of serum prostate antigen, or PSA, and digital rectal exam, or DRE. As you are probably aware, there has been a controversy in recent years surrounding the efficacy of PSA screening. Now, if both the DRE and the PSA tests are positive, then this may lead to further examinations by needle core biopsies. For this, an ultrasonic probe is used to locate the prostate from within the rectum, and then a number of samples are taken using a needle. While this procedure is the gold standard for detecting prostate cancer, it is very uncomfortable for the patient. In the laboratory, you will be examining two examples of these needle biopsies. Please remember the difference between staging and grading of cancers. Staging of a cancer is based on the size of the primary lesion, its spread to regional lymph nodes, and the presence or absence of blood-borne metastases. Now, this slide shows the staging of prostate cancer according to the TNM system. Basically, the higher the number, the worse the prognosis. For example, T1 represents very small localized tumor. Stage T2 is where the primary tumor is larger but still confined to the prostate. And stages T3 and T4, the tumor has spread to the surrounding structures. Now, prostate cancer often metastasizes to the bone, and to test for this, a bone scan may be performed. In this procedure, a radioactive substance is injected into the patient, and this is taken up preferentially where bone remodeling is taking place. Hot spots can indicate the presence of metastases from prostate and other types of cancers. On the other hand, grading of a cancer is based on the degree of differentiation of the tumor cells, and this is correlated with aggressiveness. Now, for most cancers, grading is far less important than staging in determining the prognosis and treatment. However, in the specific case of prostate cancer, grading has an elevated significance because there is a good correlation between the grading and prognosis and selecting the appropriate therapy. The most widely used technique for grading prostate cancer is called the Gleason system. In the Gleason system, the prostate is examined under low power and classified into one of the five Gleason grades based upon the glandular pattern as shown on the right here. The Gleason score is determined by adding the values of the dominant and the subdominant patterns together. For example, if 60% of the tumor has been given a grade of 3 and the remaining 40% has been graded as a 4, then the final score would be 4 plus 3 or 7, which is equivalent to a tumor of intermediate grade. Now, as we go through the slides in this laboratory, I will demonstrate how a Gleason score is obtained. Keep in mind, however, that the Gleason score only applies to adenocarcinomas. Non-cancerous tissues do not have a Gleason score.
Place the slide labeled Prostate 4 on a piece of white paper and examine it by eye. Observe that it contains two sections derived from a radical prostatectomy. Note that there is a capsule of connective tissue on one edge and normal glands inside. In this slide, you will also observe a black dye along one of the edges. This is used to define the surgical margin, which is important for determining the spread of the tumor. When the tissue is removed from the patient, its surface is painted with a dye to mark its boundary. After sectioning, the pathologist then determines if the tumor cells extend to the margin. If it does, then perhaps not all of the tumor cells have been removed. However, if no tumor is present at the boundary, then this suggests that all the tumor has been excised. Now place a slide on the microscope and examine both sections under low power. This figure shows the region near the capsule and contains the ink that indicates the surgical margin. The capsule itself contains a mixture of both smooth muscle and collagenous connective tissue. There appears to have been some bleeding in the section since the connective tissue contains red blood cells, or RBCs, that are eosinophilic staining. Also note the nerve tissue that is encapsulated and has a wavy appearance. The nuclei that you see here belong to the Schwann cells that myelinate the axons. Again, at low power, move the slide to the glandular region. Observe the morphology of the glands, which are relatively large and irregularly shaped. The glands are separated from one another by a stroma of collagenous connective tissue interspersed with smooth muscle cells. Switch to higher power and examine the epithelial cells lining the glands. Note that there are two layers of cells, basal cells, which are next to the basement membrane, and acinar cells, which are somewhat columnar. The cytoplasm on the apical end of the acinar cells has a foamy appearance due to the mucin that is secreted into the lumen. The glands here show a slight hyperplasia, however, this is relatively normal. At this point, please continue on to part two of this YouTube video.